2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. I think we can withstand a little dusting snow out there, can't we? It's been a mild winter. Not been too bad. So, amen. 2 Corinthians 11. Um, Paul's, let's, uh, let's read this passage and then we'll go to the book of Numbers. Uh, would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me, for I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I've espoused you to one husband. Uh, I want you to think about that this morning. I'm going to be preaching on marriage this morning and um, the destruction of marriage and the prevention of marriage. Okay, I want you to think of what marriage represents. It is a, the husband represents Christ. The bride represents the church. And every civilization in the world has a, has a version of marriage. Joining to, an official recognition of the joining together of a husband and wife. To my knowledge, there are no, there is no civilization ever that, um, that did not have some sort of marriage tradition. There's always a, an official recognition of the joining of a man and a wife. Even if it was a man and multiple wives, there was some sort of recognition of that. And that family unit was the stability of whatever culture or civilization that was. And because it represents Christ and His church, then it automatically is the enemy of Satan. And he's going to try to corrupt it and destroy it every way he can. And he's going to try to prevent it every way he can. And we're living in an age right now where the devil is succeeding. Um, he's very successful at keeping young people from getting married. Or from regarding marriage the way that our forefathers, our grandmothers regarded marriage and so on. So I'll be kind of explaining that during the message this morning. But it fits right in with what Paul is saying here uh, in chapter 11. The espousal is the engagement. We've been set aside. We've been promised to be married to Christ. And, and as such, then we are pre going to be presented to Christ as a chaste virgin. Pure, purified by the Holy Spirit, but pure indeed. So he says, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, he said it twice. If any, if though we are an angel from heaven, bring you any other gospel, then let him be accursed. And we've been looking at different uh, types, different doctrines, different stories that relate to the gospel and what it is and what it does and what it represents. So back in Numbers chapter 14, Numbers chapter 13, we have the story of the Moses appointing the 12 spies to go into the promised land. For 40 days. During that 40 days, they were to spy out the land. They were to bring back the report of what was in the land, whether, it, whether or not it was true what God said. They go in that land and they do not deny God what God said concerning the fruitfulness of the land. They say the land is a land of plenty. It is a land where, I mean, there's just plenty of food, there's plenty of water, there's plenty of pasture ground for our goats and sheep and everything else. But, what was it that was dwelling in that land that caused them to stop where they were and not want to go in? What was in there? The giants, okay? And I'm just, I'm one of these, I believe what the Bible says. I believe that they were giant, they were of giant stature, uh, we know that Goliath was six cubits in a span. We know that Og, his, uh, his bed that Og, the king of Bashan, slept in was over nine cubits. That's huge. Okay, that's about 13, 14 feet, something like that. That's the bed that he slept in. 
We know that the Bible refers to one of the giants, the Assyrian giant, as being a t as tall as a cedar. How tall are the cedars in our in your yard? Twenty feet? Huh? Bigger than that? So can can we believe the Bible when it says that the Assyrian was as tall as the cedar? I think so. I think we can believe it. Why? And the, here's the question. Why did God make them giants so big and so tall, so mean? Why did God allow that? Why did God do that? I think the answer is here. So uh, we were talking about this. We left off with this uh, last week. Uh, if you look in verse 24, chapter 13, um, they had a cluster of grapes, which the children of Israel cut down from thence. Um, and there was, uh, back in the previous verse, two men had to carry that cluster of grapes that was so big. So in um, verse 30 of chapter 13, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the man that went up with him, uh, but the man that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. I want you to ponder that for a little bit. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it, it is the land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Verse 33, And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Just a little side historical note here. Um, we know by way of uh, archaeological records, we know by way of the records that were kept in the land of Sumeria, or Shinar, that's what the Bible calls it, that they spoke of a race of giants called the Anunnaki. Now look at your Bible. In verse 33, they're called the sons of Anak, A-N-A-K. The term or the name Anunnaki is extremely similar to Anak. Which leads me to believe that they're talking about the same people. Because uh, Moses said in Genesis 6 that the giants were mighty men of old, men of renown. Meaning that everybody in the world knew that at one time giants lived on the earth. They were well known. They were men of renown. That's what that means. They were well known. Amongst the people, to this day, the uh, American Native Indian, First Nations people up in Canada, the uh, different tribes that existed down in Central America, South America, all of those groups have legends of giants that lived among their ancestors and fought great wars with them. And these giants were very vicious, were very mean, and normally could not be defeated. Okay? And I, I believe those stories. I may not believe every item of those stories because they're not the Bible. But I do believe what the Bible says. And I, when I hear stories like that, I don't immediately dismiss it as some fairy tale. Or a king's lie of why he couldn't defeat some army. Is he just made up some story that they were giants and that's why he couldn't defeat them. That, you know, kind of made him save face a little bit. I don't believe that. I believe they were telling, for the most part, the truth concerning these people. And so the Anunnaki or the sons of Anak were present in the land of Canaan. They, they dwelt there. Uh, they were in every city. It, I guess it could be said that a vast majority of the population of those cities were giant or the, of the race of the giants. So now look in um, verse 4. Because here's what the Israelites, here's how they responded based upon what 10 of the spies told them. 10 of the spies told them they could not go into the land. The giants were going to prevent them. 
They was just uh, signing their own death sentence. If they were to march forward, they were all going to be slaughtered and killed in the wilderness. And so here's what they came up with. They said one to another, let us make us a captain and let us return to Egypt. Now I want you to think about that. Since you've been saved, you don't have to answer this. How many times have you seriously considered going back? Okay. How many times have you seriously considered or the devil tried to tempt you with turning back and going back out in going back into Egypt where you came from? The land of bondage, the land of servitude. They said, let us make us a captain. Verse five, then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. In verse six, this is what I have up on the screen. Joshua, the son of Nun and Caleb, those are the only two men. Out of the whole group that left Egypt, those are the only two that got to go in the promised land. They led then the generation of children that were born in the wilderness. Because God did not hold them accountable for what their fathers did. So Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. Canaan land is a type and a picture of heaven. You and I want to go to heaven. There's no doubt in my mind that everybody here, everybody listening to me wants to go to heaven. You'd be stupid not to. Okay? And believe me, there's some stupid people in this world. Okay? They don't, they don't care about going. But we want to go. And so the devil seeks to prevent us from going. Remember, God has promised us that we will rule over the angels. Satan said in, Luc in uh, Lucifer chapter 5. What am I thinking? <laughs> Isaiah chapter 14. There's no book of Lucifer. Thank God for that. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 14. That's in the other Bibles. Okay. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 14. I will ascend into heaven. And I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. The devil seeks to keep you from inhabiting that land because he wants it. That land is heaven. He thinks that he can gather up a big enough army to destroy Christ and his army so that he can have heaven's throne and rule over it. He's stupid. Okay? He's stupid. He's pretty wise, I would say, but he's stupid in that area. He can't see everything. He kn the devil knows the Bible. His problem is he doesn't believe it. Okay, he doesn't believe it. He thinks that he can still overrule God. The creature always thinks that he can rule over the Creator. Okay, and it doesn't work that way. So here's here's the Promised Land. God promised it to us. God promises it to. Anybody who who will come in the name of the Lord, but you have you're always going to have people who at some point decide this is not worth it. This life that I'm living right now is not worth it. Uh, I think I I think I can just go and enjoy this world the way it is, and then maybe I'll just die and that'll be the end of it. Okay, they turn back. They go backwards. Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind, let us press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Our journey is always forward. It's never behind us. Amen? Leave what's behind you. Leave it. Keep it, keep it back there. Don't keep wanting to go back to it. And I'm, I usually, sometimes I'm bad about that. Sometimes I'm, I'm real bad about, oh, let's go back and live the way they did in the old days. That's never going to happen. Never, never going to happen. So, God just puts it in my mind. Mike, the journey that I have for you in your life is not back there. It's forward. So, Joshua's, I mean, Caleb, they're all excited. Verse 8, if the Lord delighted in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Verse 9, only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. 
Fear them not. Now, um, look at verse, oh, let's see here. Uh, where am I at? I didn't skip ahead here. Yeah. Verse 10, but with all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Verse 11, and the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? How long would it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. Underline that. Disinherit them. That is a strong word. God promised to Abraham and to his seed that he would give them the land. Now, God is revoking the inheritance. He's revoking it. He's disinheriting his people. That is a big, big, big thing. If you ponder that and ponder what it means, it would be like if, uh, if, a, if a man, if he, had, if he had great possessions or whatever, and, and he owned a big business and he's, he's raising his son up to take over in his place, now his son is going to inherit the business, he's going to inherit daddy's fortune, and he's going to run with it and do greater things than that. August Bush did that, handed it down to his children, okay, or handed it down, handed it down to his son. A lot, of, a lot of parents will do that. They'll give the sons or the daughters the family business. Sam Walton did that. He, he divided up his businesses to his children, and they're running the show right now, okay? And they're doing a far worse job than Sam ever thought about, Okay? But anyway, um, if the son keeps dishonoring the father, he's a drunkard, he's a glutton, he's a fornicator, he doesn't, he doesn't care anything about working, has no work ethic whatsoever, doesn't care anything about, all he wants to do is spend daddy's money, he doesn't want to go out and earn anything for himself, and his dad's trying to work with him, having patience with him, loving him and everything like that, but at some point, the dad sees, if I turn this business over to my son, he's going to destroy everything that I've built. I'm not going to allow that. So he disinherits the son. Now, genetically, he may still be his son. But that doesn't mean that he, by that very act, must give over his fortune and his inheritance to that child. He disinherits him. He writes a new will and he says, this new will now supersedes any other will that I may have written. Think New Testament. Is the Old Testament still in place? Is it still in force? No. The Old Testament died with the testator. It When, when Christ died, it died. You see what I'm saying? You cannot have a contract with a dead person. Immediately upon a person's death, a whole set of laws kick in play. Any money that that dead person owed, the moment that dead, that person dies, whoever he owes the money to, that's it. He's not ever going to get that back. Because you cannot enforce a contract with a dead person. So who made the contract with Israel? Who made the covenant with them? God did. God died on the cross. And when he died, that nullified the contract, the covenant. So now that covenant is no more. So God then, in Jeremiah 31, offers a new covenant, which is your New Testament. The old covenant said, here it is, here's all the commandments I give you. If you perform them flawlessly, you'll live. All right? Well, that disqualifies every one of us. Because we've all broken the law. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. So then God offers a new covenant. Jeremiah, in fact, uh, let, while we're talking about this, let's go to Jeremiah 31. Let's read it. The old covenant said, do and live. We didn't do. So therefore, we cannot live. The new covenant says, believe and live. Um, 
In verse 27 in Jeremiah 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict, so will I watch. There's five things there, by the way. So will I watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. And those, there's two things there. Five plus two is what? Seven. Okay? Seven is perfection and completion. Once God does this, it's done. What was the last three words Jesus said? It is finished. And it's over with. You know, I ought to sing that song. Melissa? I ain't sung that song in probably 40 years. A song called It Is Finished. I love it. Um, verse 29. In those days they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten sour grapes. And the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set. You know, let me tell you what 29 is. Verse 29, verse 30. The, the meaning is, because the father did this, the son must have this. In other words, because of the sins of the father, the son must pay the price. And that's, that's how it was. But now... He says, if the father ate the sour grapes, the father's teeth are going to be set on edge. You kind of get that means. So when you eat something real sour, you go, Ugh. okay, Ugh. that's a good face. Get a close up of that. Ugh. Okay. If you do the crime, you pay the penalty. That's how it is. Okay. Now look at verse 31. Let me get over to it. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. Uh, there's several different ways that God uh, showed forth this idea of a covenant to Israel. One was a, a judicial covenant where God said, if you perform this, then I will give you this. The other way that, of doing it was in a marital covenant. Marital covenants, as far as I'm concerned, as far as the law is concerned, as far as God is concerned, is just as binding as any other covenant that there is. If a spouse dies, is, that the, is the surviving spouse still married? No. They're not still married. The spouse is dead. You cannot be married to a dead person. Okay? You cannot have a contract with a dead person. That's just common law. So he, he gives them the, this brand new covenant. Even though he said, You're, you were my spouse, I espoused you. But because of your whoredoms, I had to write you a bill of divorce. Before, before there was ever the marriage, God is kicking Israel out and saying... You're not ever going to be my wife. And I'm never going to be your husband. So God put them away. And then God died. So now he says, um, verse 33, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Now think about what that means. What is it that we know about DNA? DNA determines everything that we are as a creature or a creation of God. All right? God has given us the ability to stand on two feet and walk that way. Now you say, well, bears and monkeys do that. Not by, that's not their primary means of moving around. Okay? Okay. They go on all fours. Every now and then they'll stand up for a little bit, do little things, but it's not their primary means of moving around. God wrote that into their DNA and God wrote standing up and walking on two feet into our DNA. We don't have to convince our young children through teaching and training and instruction that walking on two feet is far superior than walking on all fours at some point they start figuring this out on their own, don't they? They start, they, they first they crawl. Then we see them pull themselves up, stand next to the couch or whatever, uh, next to the chair and hold themselves up for a while. Maybe walk around holding on to something. But at some point, they walk 
on their own two feet because it's written into their nature. Make sense? Here's what God's going to do. God's going to write His law, not just in a book outside of our heart. He's going to write it in our heart. So that we perform the works of the law, not because we have to. We do it because it's in our nature to do it. Amen? It's in our nature to do it. God writes it in there. So, all those things where he said, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. Guess what's going to happen? We won't kill. We won't commit adultery. We won't lie. We won't bear false witness. We won't covet. We'll honor the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We're going to do all the things that God commanded us to do. That law is still good. Amen? But it, that, that itself is not the basis of why or how God saves us. He's not saving us according to our own righteousness. He's saving us because He loves us and then He grants to us His own righteousness. So He says, I'll write, I'll write the, put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them even to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That's the new covenant. And God grants that on the basis of His love and His grace and our faith and nothing else. Amen. I preached that last Sunday morning. Justification by faith. That God's righteousness is on us right now even though we have sinned. And by the way, think about it. From the time of Moses on to the time of Jesus, how many chances did God grant Israel to stay in His grace? How many times did God forgive Israel? Many times. God did not wait for them to commit their first sin and say, Aha, gotcha! I'm going to send you to hell right now. That's not what God did. God gave them chance after chance after chance after chance. And finally, God severed his relationship with Israel, writes them a bill of divorce and says, You're not mine anymore. And we'll never, we'll never be married, ever. How true is that? The one who said that died. The new man now is resurrected in the form of Jesus Christ, the righteous. And now, I'm, that's kind of getting too deep and I don't have the notes for it. But anyway, the contract of the old covenant is null and void. Don't let anybody try to talk you into this notion that you must go back and keep the law in order to be saved. It's a lie. Let me show you. Let me, uh oh. Let me show you what that looks like. It's still up there. Uh, let's see here. Where's my note? Oh, you're going to like this. Who in here knows anything about Mormon doctrine? Anybody? Let me enlighten you. Uh, on the front of the Book of Mormon, it says another testament of Jesus Christ. You know what that is, in other words? Another gospel. They label it. They label it. Another testament of Jesus Christ. And where did it come from? An angel from heaven. An angel from, supposedly an angel from heaven woke Joe Smith up and said, the church is all bad. God's, God's got this hidden gospel. I'm going to have you find it. You're going to dig it up. And I'm going to help you translate it so you can restore the gospel to this earth. Okay? I heard a song. A lady, she did, she did this in ignorance. She had no idea what she was doing. But she posted a song on Facebook and said, I just love this song. And I started listening to it. And it talked about the gospel that he restored. And I went, that's a Mormon hymn. She didn't, I didn't say anything to her. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to be mean to her like I am other people on Facebook. Okay. That's why I don't go there. But 
So I didn't, I didn't say anything. But when I heard it, I'm going, that's a Mormon hymn. Talking about the gospel that Joe Smith restored on this earth. It's another gospel. Here's what one of the books, Second Nephi. Every time I see that word, I want to think of grape soda for some reason. Nehi, never mind. Here's what, here's what the Book of Mormon says. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. That's a lie. It's trying to establish this idea that God will not give you any grace whatsoever until you have proven your worth by doing every act of righteousness that you can possibly do. Then he will give you grace. That's another gospel. Um, here's what a man by the name of Ezra Taft Bradley used to know all these names. Ezra Taft, who was uh, one of the prophets of the Mormon church. Here's what he said. 13th president of the Mormon church. Here's what he said. What is meant by after all we can do? He's quoting from 2 Nephi. He says, after all we can do includes ex extending our best effort. After all we can do includes living his commandments. After all we can do includes loving our fellow men and praying for those who regard us as their adversary. After all we can do means clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, visiting the sick, and giving succor to those who stand in need of our succor. And he's quoting from Mosiah 4.15. Remembering that we do unto thee, or unto one of the least of God's children, we do... A, I read that wrong. Remember that what we do unto one of the least of God's children, we do unto him. After all we can do means leading chaste, clean, pure lives, being scrupulously honest in all our dealings, and treating others the way we would want to be treated. In other words, after you do enough works, then God will apply grace. It's a lie. There was a man on the cross who died the same day Jesus did. How many righteous deeds did he perform in order to go to heaven? He couldn't. He's nailed to a cross. He can't, he can't make the sign of the cross. He can't get down and walk on his knees. He can't feed the hungry people. He did only what he could do, which is he believed that Jesus was Lord and he believed that God was going to raise him from the dead even before he died. That's what he believed. I'm not done. And then Harold Lee, 1956, said this, but all of these blessings are ours on one condition. And this is spoken of by Nephi when he said, for we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God for we know that it is by grace that we are saved, but mark you this condition after all we can do. That's what they believe. Here's what the Book of Mormon says in the Book of Moron, I. Chapter 10. Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in Him and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if you shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind and strength, then is His grace sufficient for you that by His grace you may be perfect in Christ. And if by, grace, if by the grace of God you are perfect in Christ, you can in no wise deny the power of God. Again, it's trying to establish that you must do enough works so that you can get the grace. And the Bible makes it clear. If I'm giving you a gift. Then it is not owed to you. Nor do you owe me for the gift. Now if you do work for me. Then I pay you wages. Wages are not a gift. They're not. Or. If I give you something and say it's a gift, and then I require something back from you, then it's not a gift. 
you have to, you either already labored for it and I owe it to you, or I give it to you and then I say, you must labor for me and do these things, then I will do this. Most political transactions that go on in Jefferson City, in Washington, D.C., and in Hillsborough are done by way of, you owe me a favor now. Politics knows nothing of grace. Politicians know nothing of serving their constituents for nothing in return. They don't even know what those words mean. Because all they know is, well, I did this, what are you going to do for me? You want me to vote for your bill? Fine. My uh, district needs about $4 million dollars uh, so that our guys can go to work. How about you write in there that you're going to give us $4 million, then I'll vote for your stupid bill. That's how that stuff works. That's why a bill that goes through Congress is never that big. It's always this big. Because after the upper parties in Congress have worked out all these backroom door deals, then the bill that should look like this has turned into this because now they're going to funnel money to all these congressmen's districts to get them to vote for that bill. They know nothing about grace. And they know nothing about serving the American people because they don't serve us. What they do, we owe them. Because they don't do anything except there's payback involved, either legal or illegal. Can I hear you say amen? That's the kind of nonsense that's thrown about in the Mormon church, the Jehovah's Witness church, the Roman Catholic church. And there's scores and hundreds of other churches, ministries, and denominations that are emphasizing the outward appearance or the outward manifestation over what God does inwardly. Amen? They emphasize that and say, you must do this, or you must look like this, or you must perform this, or you must give this much in order for God's grace to be applied to you. And that's a lie. Remember what I said at the beginning of this. The, the moment someone adds any kind of performance to the gospel, it ceases to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not his gospel. What God gave to you, God gave to you freely. He didn't require anything then. He's not requiring anything now with the exception of your faith. And faith is not a work. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, teach us more about this grace. Lord, I believe that if we will understand your grace toward us, then Father, we'll manifest grace to other people. God, when we understand that you have forgiven us freely then Lord, we are going to be forgiving of others and things that other people have done to us. We're going to be forgiving of them freely without requiring anything. And Father, just give us this ministry of grace. Give us the gospel, Lord, to carry forth from this place because there's a lot of people out there, Lord, that need it. They're hungry, they're starving, and they're dying. And they need to be fed with the gospel. Father, put it in our heart to feed them, to do this freely. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Let me throw one more thing in here and we'll let you go. If we will put it in our minds to try to win people to Jesus Christ without the idea that we're going to try to get them then to come to our church. If we will cut that off, God will bless this church. And he already has. But if we, then if we just say, you know what, I'm going to do what God told me to do, and I'm going to leave it up to God where He sends them, if we'll get that fixed in our mind, God will bless what you're doing. Amen? Amen.